instead of like complaining to the law society and waiting for four years, I'm just going to post <laughs> screenshots. You realize that you've made a mistake, you apologize for it, and you never repeat it again, you're in a safe environment. I feel like we live in a world of abundance and we're all, there, there's a space for everybody, including the We are back with another episode of the What You're About podcast with me, Chad Abood. And this is a really cool one because Lena Yousefi and I, you know, we had a conversation. It was maybe 45 minutes if I was lucky with her time in Vancouver, but it was deeply heartfelt, stuck with me, stood with me. I wanted to have another one. We have this podcast time around the future of law, and we are with someone who is the future of law. So, Everyone who's been listening to this season knows that this is a collab season with Good Lawyer, and we're just talking to, interviewing, learning from folks that are creating the future of law now. Lena Youssefi is doing this. Why law? You know, you're the CEO, you're the you're the leader, you're a lawyer, you're a practicing lawyer inside it as well. You're doing all things. Massively growing firm, five years straight on the Globe and Mail, fastest growing companies in Canada list. Saw your colleagues there when Good Lawyer got to, got its award. And, and you're one of the few companies that's been on for that many years in a row. So, so Law got special mention. You're top 40 under 40, Lexpert rising star, author. There's a million things. But for me, most importantly, is I deeply appreciate how much you want to make the industry better, the lives of lawyers better, the ones that work in your firms, but others too. And you share courageously, very brave, very real about what's going on in the family law space, in your firm, what you're seeing in the industry, ways that you've turned your firm into a leader from a policy perspective about how you treat your lawyers. And, and I know that law firms all over the country reach out to you to try to learn more. So, you know, you are the future already, my friend, and I couldn't think of anyone better from that perspective to share with us how you got there, what motivates you, what you've learned along the way and where you're taking it next. Mm -hmm. So Lena Yousefi, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. I'm very excited. No, oh, we're going to do it. And the first thing that I wanted to ask you, because, you know, when we're recording this mid-October, yeah. you put out a post this week and everything that you write gets a lot of attention and it gets even more attention than people are willing to engage because what you write is so courageous. But you had something that really, really caught my eyeballs this week. And, you know, we don't have to get into the details of the specific case, but what you were doing was highlighting that participants in the legal industry mm. sometimes aren't being as transparent or honest with the status of a case, the status of the lawyers, the way the representation is working. And maybe they're even encouraging some misinformation if they feel it suits, you know, their side of the story and you wouldn't stand for it. And yeah. you had the receipts, you attached the receipts and you told the story and you helped get some correction to it. And so just right out the gate, because I think it speaks so much about who you are and what you're about. Can you take us through a little bit of just how you got the courage to put out that post, why you did it and what it means to you? I, I think the two things that are really ruining the legal profession are the lack of transparency and accountability. Um, and, and that's rampant when it comes to sexual abuse, uh, sexual harassment, emotional abuse, uh, the way that we're dealt with sometimes in the sphere of litigation. Um, the fact that there's so much power imbalance in, in the legal practice that, that if, if you're not in the power position, you're basically going to have to pay for years and with so, like so much money just to get some justice. And I'm really tired of it. I am no longer going to stand for it. I'm not going to stand up for bullshit anymore. I'm not going to put up with bullshit anymore, for lack of a better term. So um, in the past, you know, like, and I'm not about talking about this specific instance, but in the past, you know, I've spoken to numerous men or women who have these traumatic experiences that they don't pursue because they say mm -hmm. either they're going to get sued by six lawyers for defamation or you're lying right. or whatever, get dragged through the years, through the dirt for years. 
and then come out having wasted all the time and energy and money just to prove a point. And a lot of them don't even start. And then this lack of accountability and transparency keeps on going in the legal profession unaccounted for. Uh, people get away with a slap on the wrist or not at all, and they continue the same behavior that is no longer acceptable. So the, the really cool thing I think about social media is that it gives people equal opportunity to say their piece without being sued for defamation, without spending years, you know, like having to prove something to some entity in order to get some relief, right? Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. So, you know, the other day I was, for example, speaking, um, you know, to a lawyer who had gone through, you know, years of being, you know, sexually harassed. And she's like, you know, instead of like complaining to the law study and waiting for four years, I'm just going to post <laughs> screenshots of, our conversation with this person who said, you know, they, you know, like the, the things that I'm not going to actually repeat, but they were heinous. And she, and, and I was like, you know what? That's, that's even better, you know, <laughs> than, than going, you know, through the uh, traditional ways of doing law and uh, doing whatever complaint you have in, in some situations. I feel like I had to stand up for myself and my reputation and my friend's reputation. I feel like yeah. a lot of times because I'm, I don't want to play the woman card here, but because, but I have to say, because I'm a minority and a woman, people think they can get away by, by dragging yeah. me through the dirt. And my reputation and my friend's reputation is absolutely my biggest asset. And it's just, just like it's yours. You get one bad uh, rep on, on social media or media or outside and you're done. So I yeah. will fight for that tooth and nail. It's not personal. It's just speaking the truth. And I'm going to continue well, doing that. If, if, if people didn't know that by now, they know now, you know, yeah. because you've, you've done this, you've done this courageously before. And I'm so, you know, really just, I, I feel like you're such an example of, you don't just talk about it, you be about it. And then, you know, you allow other people to feel more permission to do the same thing or, or a similar thing for, for themselves. And I think that's a massive impact. I mean, obviously your firm's massively successful. It's the largest, you know, female led law firm in the country mm -hmm. and you've built it organically. You know, yeah. it's, it's an unbelievable story that I'm sure many people who've, who've seen your stuff understand and know, but to build something yourself, almost straight out of law school, like very yeah. quickly after law yeah. school, you started yeah. building your own thing and you've grown it to be one of, you know, the largest female led law firm in the country with massive law firms coming to you to learn from you about how you've created four day work weeks and different types of compassionate leaves and, and other leaves of the company doing different types of wellness and retreats for the lawyers to make sure that not only are you grabbing incredible substantive talent, yeah. but there are people who deeply feel connected to why law and your yeah. clients. And so, you know, maybe you can tell us a little bit about like, was this always something that was deeply meaningful for you? Like being courageous, being outspoken, trying to find equity. Like, is this a theme of your life or was it you came into the legal industry and saw so much injustice that you had to, you know, go from zero to a hundred quickly? I, I think just like my nature is as crazy as the post that you saw. Like my, like I, <laughs> I'm crazy. I've been called crazy. I love being crazy. And the part of that crazy, well, I don't know, maybe you want to call it crazy, but it's really about taking risks and being unafraid. And it's so ironic because I actually suffer from major anxiety um, myself. I've, I've, um, I've, I've lived with anxiety all my life. Uh, it's, and so I have this fear of everything. And at the same time, I have no fear of everything. And usually the, the, the side of me that has no fear wins, right? So uh, the reason why, why we even started gaining any traction is because people kept on pointing at me and being like, look how crazy she is. Look what she's writing on the net. Like right back then, like 10 years ago, I started this, like, I look at it right now today. I'm like, man, I was crazy, but I haven't taken it off. Like the reason why, why even got any attention was because I wrote this series called the secret life of a lawyer. And, um, and I actually exposed the, workaholism that was being fed to us by the judiciary, by other lawyers, by our firms and whatever. And a lot of people called me crazy and, and, and said she's nuts for being a junior lawyer and writing about this. And then a lot of people reached out and they said, you're speaking our mind. Like we've been just kind of like keeping this hidden because we're afraid of being unemployable or, you know, people judging us. Right. So that's what started. And then, th then this, again, I, I started seeing the issues and instead of, being private about it, I was just super public about it, just like I am right now. And it gained a lot of traction. So I think 
you know, I, I keep on thinking about this a lot. It's like the, the, the minority, which is the crazy in me, is actually what the majority thinks but doesn't talk about. You know, the reason why I've gained any success is because I, I open my mouth and I have a very loud mouth. So um, that's been the ingredient behind it. I also have a very innovative mind. When I see problems, I come up with solutions and, and then I'm not afraid of um, implementing them. And so far they've, they've proven to be very effective and I'm just, I guess I'm very lucky. So there you Well, go. I mean, so all of that is true. One, one piece I would layer in is like, Okay, you speak your mind, but you're very thoughtful and you're very empathetic. And so you're not just shooting from the hip. I mean, you're leading with the passion that you feel for the industry and like the drive that you have to make it better. And so, you know, we need bullhorns behind this thing because the industry is so medieval in so many ways and you just refuse to let it stay in the dark ages. And, yeah. you know, if it's if it's you that has to be the person that leads, then you do it. Yeah. Um, and so maybe you can tell us a little bit about like, what does it look like at Y Law, right? Like everyone feels the passion from you all the time. Yeah. You had very specific items you've brought into your firm that have gained tons of attention. Yeah. And there's the types of things that the industry has told us will burn law firms because they just won't be able to be profitable and the lawyers will just become lazy and stop working. Yeah. And so can you tell us a little bit about what are some of the biggest initiatives you've brought in? Mm -hmm. How have they worked? What are your reflections on them? And can you still make money? Yeah. Um, <laughs> okay. So the, the thing that kind of like gets my heart pumping is that, you know, as much as, you know, like you can, whatever the med medieval, uh, like uh, nature of the law firms and stuff like that also means that it's Greenland for so much innovation. So yeah. some days I actually wake up with my heart just pumping out of my chest with excitement about the amount of things we can do. Like it's, it's on believable right so i don't i don't i don't live in a sphere of oh my god we're all victims and you know we're all victimized and everything sucks so much and it's never going to get better i live in a world of i'm going to implement all these cool things and i'm going to show that it's going to pay back 100 times right but i make those decisions by very calculated you know data database um, kind of like risk taking so um for example, with the four day work week, right? Like on the face of it, people think that you're, you're losing 20% of your time. But yeah. really what it is, is I've explained this many times. If you're working five days a week, you know, like how many on average, how many days a month are your lawyers taking off being sick? Let's say one day a month, right? How many days are actually long, like the long weekends per month is another one day, right? Yeah. Then, then you have your doctor appointments. I have to leave a little bit early. My kid is sick. You add that, that's probably another one day, right? And then the, the other one day, you look at Fridays, you know, like compare your productivity on a Friday versus a Monday. On, on Fridays, I think if you have one or two hours of productivity, you're lucky. Everybody's looking forward to happy hour. Everybody's whatever, like just get out of it. So why don't you condense all that into, you know, right. one day a week, like the four day work weeks. You tell your people you're working four day work weeks and, and see what happens, right? So you're not really losing any time. You're just kind of like repackaging the time that you're already losing by looking at the data and offering four day work weeks and telling them, take this one day, do whatever you need to do, be sick, be hungover, you know, take your kids to whatever, do your hike. So what we saw is when we did that, I'm, I'm not bullshitting you. Like our, not only did we like triple quadruple in size, like within the first month, our profits were, had, had gone up by 30%. Wow. Because people were uh, feeling not just mentally better, they're feeling like they have, they have some control over their schedule. And then they were happier. They were more loyal. You know, our, our, um, turnover is zero unless it's, you know, some family emergency or somebody moving. We don't have people moving to another firm. And if you've ever run a law firm, you will know that the amount of money you lose by turnover, you know, the amount of time and money you have to spend in replacing the person yeah. that left is uh, on average, they say 30, 40, 30 to $40,000 per person. We, ha we have none of that, right? So that's just one of the examples, right? That, that we've implemented that's, that's, that's showing us results. And my goal is 
I'm gonna die trying to show that this model works. I feel like I'm one day I'm just gonna because it takes a lot of energy um, yeah, to yeah. just like prove to a lot of people who are non-believers that this is gonna work. But I, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna prove it, and if not, I'm gonna die trying to prove it. So there you go. I think I think the future is gorgeous and, and beautiful for law firms like the amount of potential we have in tech you know like we're just about to release it release a software to help with access to justice like what we can do with ai and tech and and, and law is just like something that's so exciting so i think the future is bright i'm not i love, it. I love it. it i'm a big I'm, I'm also a big believer in i think it's actually pretty great how medieval the legal industry is for many right. reasons because so many industries like if you look at what good lawyer does like fractional general counsels, fractional in-house lawyers. Well, there's lots of industries that have been doing fractional CFOs, fractional CF CMOs for a yeah. long time. And yeah. so the benefit yeah. of the legal industry is you can learn from all of the other industries that realized decades ago you could do four-day work week or you could do pat leaves or longer yeah. mat leaves or more care or more wellness activities. Other industries already figured this out and they have already been doing it. And so for those like you um, in the legal space that are willing to bet on yourself, bet on your people and yeah. – you, oh, you already have roadmaps from other industries too about how it can work. So, you know, whether other people believe it or not, that I, I feel like that is a legal industry problem rather than a larger macro problem because yeah. other companies, big FIs, tech companies have been doing four days a week for yeah. the last like few years. And many of them have showed like record profits. So, you know, it's clearly working for you. Yeah. But what do you, what do you do? And I imagine you're not that stressed by it, but what do you do when you get so much pushback about, hey, Lena, like, dial it down a little bit. You're going to alienate these people. You're going to, or you're really going to share that much info with like other yeah. law firms about how you're being successful. Like when you get this pushback from your peers saying like, you're going a little bit too far, either you're telling people too much or you're yeah. pushing too much around these policies. How do you feel? What do you say? What's your reaction to that? Um, I, my purpose in life is not to make the most money, it's not to get rid of competition, it's not to, I, I, I feel like we live in a world of abundance and we're all, there, there's a space for everybody, including the assholes, including the lazy ones, including the conservative ones, like there's space for all of us, you know, like we don't need to just be one like there's space for big law, there's space for good lawyer, there's space for for wild law. So what I try to do is to expose my model to whoever is interested. And I have never, I I made a pact with myself never to say no to people who reach out to me and, and want help and do it at no cost. And wow. that has that has taken so much time to the point that sometimes I'm booking like eight months in advance to meet with these wow. people. So, but I still meet, I still give them time. I just say, you have to wait eight months to meet with me. It's our duty to make each other better, to make, to help each other's mental health, to, to, to make the world go, go around. It's our duty. Like what, if I, if I die knowing that I made things a little bit better, that's going to be the best death ever that I could ever imagine. So I'm never worried about, I've never gone based on that model. And I do give freely, I, you know, like in, in any way I can, I'm going to continue doing that. I, I just, we're not, we, we need to look at the world from a place of abundance, not, um, not, it, it's something that Quinn Ross says, I forgot the name of it, but what's the opposite of abundance? Scarcity. Scarcity. Yeah, there you go. So that's yeah. just my model. Well, and I think what well, you, and, you know, deeply supportive of that. And I think what I, I felt in my own journey and what I've seen in yours is that the abundance and the giving first yeah. It actually gives right back to you. Like people yeah. know that you're a big giver. People know that you're very innovative because you share. And so because yeah. you share, other industry participants come to you, lawyers come to you, clients become aware of you yeah. because you share that message first. I was I was at a, an international law firm earlier this week giving um, a bit of a talk around this idea to the associates. And what I was saying is that a lot of folks, they wait until someone's given to them before they help. They're nice folks. Yeah. They'll help. Yeah. They'll be matchers, but yeah. they're not going to give first because they're worried that someone's just going to take their information and run. And what I've yeah. always found is the vast majority of people who you help first, they want to help you and more later. And you don't have to like tug them around and beg for their support. They're just, they're yeah. thinking of you 
yeah. they want to help you and they direct people to you. And your firm is like such an example of doing this thing that a lot of lawyers are nervous about helping first, yeah. giving a free time. Yeah. And your, your firm has grown organically like crazy. And you were saying before we came on here, because I was saying, Hey, I want to support your firm and let people know where to find you. And you're saying, we, we got lots of clients, Chad, you don't yeah. have to worry about pumping up my yeah. law firm too much. And this is the point is that like, because you give first so much is did you see that happening as you were doing it or is it just this beautiful byproduct or were you aware of like i'm giving so much first and it's actually coming back around to me yeah i i i'm two things first like when i was a sole practitioner and i don't recommend this but i cared so much about my clients i bled for them and they really saw that so the word mm -hmm. of mouth uh, just went out there in the city being like, you know, this girl will kill herself for your case. I don't recommend this. Um, so that was the first thing that got us a lot of, uh, and then the second thing is, I, as you know, I love writing. I'm an online girl. I love writing. Right now, I'm, I'm putting a lot of that writing on LinkedIn. But back then, I just put a lot of that giving information online to people by way of writing a lot of blogs. And they were reading the information. Again, I wasn't asking for anything back. But they, and, and then I started writing for a newspaper about, you know, like legal things that people need to know about. And my own journey, I'm a storyteller. Um, yeah, it was always having no agenda except giving. And like, it, it still lasts to this day. You know, when I see people, I, I have no agenda. Like, I don't understand like networking where you reach out to somebody and you go with an agenda of here, here I am. Let's, let's do business together. To me, that feels extremely unnatural. I don't think it's the future. I think the new generation is looking for authenticity and transparency. And when they see that, there's, trust formed and, and there's long lasting relationships. So, um, and, and that's what I tell all of our people at Wyla that, you know, like you need to give without expecting anything back and it will give back tenfold. You and I are meeting so many like-minded people because we're speaking our mind. We're speaking our truth. I see what you say on like It's so genuine that we're attracting people who want to think like us. And when, and when we do that, we're attracting partners at the same time without even knowing we're attracting business and things like that. To me, it's so natural and organic and enjoyable that I would never want to have it any other way, to be honest. I ever. totally, totally agree. What I found is when you share what you care about, other people see things in you that you didn't necessarily see, whether it's a path or an attribute or a skill or a presence that you bring. And that creates its own opportunities because then people say, hey, Lena, do you ever think about doing this? Do you ever want to do this? And you might not have seen that for yourself or recognize that yet, but it comes from sharing first about what you know and what you care about. And so I, I agree too that not only does it bring a quantum of opportunities, but it brings a quality of opportunities that you couldn't conjure up on your own if you were just like staying within yourself and not wanting to tell people and not wanting to share you you brought something up there about your journey as a solo firm owner and I know that you built your firm quite quickly after law school but there's lots of folks who are kind of in that I mean for definitely first five to ten years but then even folks who are you know 10 20 years out that are thinking to themselves like okay I've worked at a law firm I've worked at a big law firm a medium-sized law firm I've worked in-house I don't know if I fit in these traditional models yeah maybe I want to be like Lena and start my own firm yeah. when you're thinking back to like the wins that you had the the challenges that you faced the reflections that you've had like what would you say to these like aspiring you know small yeah. and solopreneur owners law firm owners I think every human, especially lawyers, we all have a need to evolve, right? So like staying stagnant in any position at any stage of life is something that naturally we're averse to most of us anyway. Like some people right. don't mind, but I think with lawyers, especially because we're constantly challenged, we want to challenge ourselves. I think the issue that I see is, you know, like most lawyers are told, you know, here's your career path. You work as an associate. You can go out on your own. You can become a partner, uh, or you can have your you can have your own firm and you can expand. And then there's a lot of reward attached um, to lawyers who either become partners or go out on their own. Um, AKA, if you do those things, you're a good lawyer. But if you stay as an associate for more than five, seven years, then then there's something wrong with you. Like you're not ambitious enough. You, and I completely disagree with that. Right? Again, I said. There is a place for every one of us in the world. Uh, from what I see when I when I have mid-level to senior lawyers reaching out to me is um, there's either a fear 
of the, the marketing side of things, the going out on your own, the getting your clients, there's a fear yep. in that, or there's this lack of interest in doing your own administrative work, you know, hiring your mm-hmm. own people, spending a lot of time, you know, doing a lot of things that are not related because, hey, you became a lawyer to practice law. You didn't become a lawyer to, you know, like do your own bills, which is actually what I did and I hated it at the beginning. Thank God I don't do that anymore. It was terrible, the trust accounting. Um, so, like, I... And then, you know, there are some lawyers who are just not market, they're not business people, you know, they don't have an interest in having the biggest firm. So what I usually say is there are like entities out there such as good lawyers, right? Like where you say, I'm, I want to get out of this firm because I don't want to be told that I have to meet this target all the time. And I have to, you know, like schmooze and do X and Y with the client. But I also don't want to go out on my own and spend so much time, you know, like setting myself up as a sole practitioner and I don't like the isolation. So what can I do to kind of like have this like perfect situation for myself? And so we also at Wyla, just like good lawyer, have established formulas for lawyers who want to go out on their own. They want to get a good cut of what they earn, but they want to leave all the ad- administrative client blaming things to somebody else. And I think that's a really almost a perfect model um, for some lawyers, right? I, I don't think that they're not ambitious enough. It, it's just an alternative model that's gaining traction, as I can see, you know, you know, you know, in your business and also in mine, that's just as good as the other models. So really like what, what, what it comes down to me, like I, I, I'm more of an entrepreneur than a lawyer. I, I never was set out to be a lawyer. I did it because it was kind of like a guaranteed income and there was a, prestige coming with it, to be honest. But right now I'm not practicing law at all. Um, and, and I'm just running the business, right? So like what I do may, may come with a lot of, you know, like acknowledgement and uh, praise, but it may not be right for a lot of lawyers. And I don't and I don't think everybody should be striving to be the big law partner or the sole practitioner or whatever. I just don't think that's fair to them. I think we just have to look at what, what our purpose is and just create a model for ourselves. Because like I said, there's space for all of us, no matter who we yeah. are. I think that's, it's beautiful. You know, we all have our own natural way, our, our own better abilities. And some of us are business innovators like you. Some people are substantive subject matter experts and love the work. Some people are extremely good at process building. Some people are great at sales and marketing and we need everyone. And so it's really about maybe stepping back from, I feel like I'm supposed to be this way or do this. And we're just pushing boulders uphill. And like, yes, you can do it and you'll get the boulder up the hill, but you're going to be like Lena doing trust accounting where it's like, it's painful. It's slow. You're worried that the boulder is going to roll back over you. And instead you want to be Lena, the business innovator. That's like finding paths for people to bring their greatest talents into that right fit role. And then you can be the one who's innovating and building a brand and like driving all this awareness and business for folks that want to be either process people or subject matter experts to do what they want to do without that pressure. And so I always think of it as like, ideally you're pushing the boulder down the hill and, and you know, that's, that's what you're doing, which is such a great example. And so when you think about, you know, you do so many innovative things for Wylon, for the industry, like what is something that's on your mind that's next? That's like the future for Wylaw and yeah. for you? Uh, I'm very excited about this. Actually, I feel like um, like uh, I and Wylaw are like a caterpillar that are becoming a butterfly and it's very, very painful as, as we're kind of like getting out of the skin of the um, caterpillar. We have very, very ambitious goals, which I'm setting up, you know, within a grand scheme. Uh, we, like, we started off as a family law firm and I just, like, I feel like I want to expand the model to other areas. So, uh, we have, we were just finishing up building an 8,000 square foot office. Um, we are adding employment law, which I think is super natural. Like we've, we've done all these employment policies, innovative policies within the workplace. Right. Why don't we defend, you know, as well and, you know, spread it through the law that we practice. So, uh, we're, we, yes. I am aggressively going after the employment law sphere and other litigation sources. And we want to become one of the biggest regional law firms right now. Uh, and with the potential of uh, expanding into, you know, nationally, if I don't die before them, before them from overwork and stress, to be honest. We, we can't let that happen. We need you. We need you. That can't happen. Yeah. At least I'll do what I love. But <laughs> more exciting than that is the tech innovations that, that we're going to uh, bring about. 
even what the lawyers, like the software that lawyers are, are using right now is so monopolized and exploited that I want to bring all this software and all this AI into the legal sphere for almost nothing, for almost no fee, for almost nothing. I just want to show a big middle finger also to the corporations that are taking advantage of the legal wow. world. Like, I, I'm just here to help everybody. So uh, that's what I'm working on. And, and uh, there's going to be a lot of products coming into the market to help family law clients, to help family law lawyers, and to uh, potentially help employment clients and lawyers. So um, I can't wait. I can't say much about it right now, but I think the future of Y Law is a hybrid of digital and physical law firm and, and a beautiful synergy between the two, not a competition. You know, one of my favorite things about you, of many, is that you um, you do the things that people talk about in their titles, like people call themselves disruptors and instead you just go and like do it and then everyone calls you a disruptor, which which I, I just love it. I just love it how you do the thing first and then other people will just say that about you instead yeah. of you just telling people. Um, you're, <laughs> you're just incredible at that. Okay, so... Rapid fire questions here before we close it out. So thinking back, you know, you've been through such a big journey and, you know, it must, it probably feels like a very long time, but over the scope of your life still, like you can remember back to when you started Y Law and you remember thinking about going to the industry, like what is your best advice for earlier Lena? The only thing that you, th you should think about is what is it that you want? Not what is it that other one, others want or what? They see that that is the biggest life lesson that I'm still answering. If you ever, ever think or place too much emphasis on what others expect or want, you're going to you're always going to go the wrong direction. The only time that I was able to make it and improve was when I only answered myself. And I, you know, I, I have a you want to call it God, God, your real self, your spiritual self, whatever. If the answer between me and my God was a yes. And I followed that. I never regretted that decision. But if I didn't, but if I doubted that that connection, and I kept on thinking about what the others were thinking and feeling, I almost always make mistakes. So that's my. I hear favorite. you. I hear you. I'm a when when what's your um, astrological sign, by the way? Libra. Yeah, all about justice, Libra. right? That, hence my social media post. <laughs> Terrible, it's but yeah. because what you were saying about like listening to so I'm a I'm a Pisces, which is like a very relational sign, yes. and um, it resonated with what you said because I too have felt that way. But what I find is when you um, when you're very relational and you don't love conflict, it is very easy to get swayed by feeling like you're empathizing and supporting other people, yes. and you can be very effective and yes. connected to people in the way that they want. But sometimes you lose track of like where you want to take it yourself. And, yeah. and so it really resonated with you said that because for me, I've had to take like massive, like Please. jumps across the chasm to get back on track. Like, you know, leaving a law firm and traveling around the world, leaving my GC life to like build yeah. a business. And like, because for me, I can like start moving down a stream that I feel like is supportive of other people yeah. and I just feel good helping people. And so I can get a little bit lost. And so, yeah. you know, I appreciated that you said that it's always a good reminder for me. Yeah. Um, second question for you is, you know, you've built something outside the traditional model. Mm -hmm. What would you want people to know that is like your biggest learning about building an atypical legal career? What's the scariest thing you'd want people to be able to overcome or the hardest thing you've overcome about doing it differently? Uh, being isolated, laughed at, hated on, um, in the legal community. And, and you know what, what's, what's more painful about it is, um, the, the closer the community is, the more people are shit talk you and hate you and don't give you like unfairly don't even give you opportunities. So at the beginning, it was really interesting at the beginning when I was gaining a bit of traction, it was all Toronto that was coming after me. People in Toronto saying, you know, can you, can you speak at this event? Can you write this book? Can you do X, Y, and Z? And, uh, it, like the silence of Vancouver was deafening, right? Mm. And then, like, I, I, I have people applying to me, like lawyers applying to me who would say, you know, like, I, I was interviewing with this other firm and they were saying that Lena is a cokehead. Why are you applying to her? And I'm like, where the, what? did they, did they, like, no, it, it was bad. Like, that, that, that I was, you know, sleeping with my, boss that I was irrational that I was slutty that that I was wow. I was crazy and 
Um, when I, yeah, like when I talked about my mental health issues, I was called crazy, like somebody who's unstable and, you know, can't, can't, uh, can't handle herself. That was terrible and, and it hurt. Mm-hmm. It, like, it still like gets me very emotional, but mm-hmm. I went from a place of people pointing their fingers and laughing at me. There were times where so it's getting me very emotional, like um, competition or ex-employers would come to our workspace and take pictures of our renovations. And then they would go and spread those images to other uh, lawyers uh, trying to say that our workplace is dirty and this is where we work from. And then when the re- renovations were done and it looked like a state of the art, they wouldn't come to take photos and say, hey, look how nice of a place that is. Like th- there were people showing up to our events and parties acting like they were allies and, and lifelong friends. And they were like behind the scenes poaching, poaching my lawyers and like shit talking me, you know, like wow. this, is, this business is not for the faint of heart. It's terrible sometimes. Like the amount of toxicity and negativity and hate that you get is, is brutal. And it's hilarious that people think that, you know, I suffer because of my gender or the fact that I'm a minority. I don't. My race and, and my gender haven't, haven't hampered me as much as other people have because they, they're, they're, because they're jealous or they can't stand competition. How do, so, how do you get through that? That's like so painful and something that not a lot of lawyers at that level are even experience. Like, how do you get through that? You, you, like, I mean, you don't, you know, I have, I have, well, you do and you don't, but like, you know, I've, I've had days where I like, don't come out of bed, you know, like sometimes I have to actually like, let, let that pain and trauma go through my body and come out, which, uh, which, you know, like, you know, th- there's a quite a bit of grieving period and, you know, like I have my therapist mm-hmm. and stuff. I just, you know, walk through it. But the thing is, the, the one thing I do is I, I don't resist it. I let it come through me and then I let it out as soon as I can. So like, it doesn't last more than a day or two. I don't let it get, like, I always get up and I, and I run even harder. So me, I'm a soldier. I don't give up. And that's been the one thing that's, that keeps me going. So yeah, I, I do get hurt. I'm, I'm not going to say I don't care about what people say or think I do. But I like I, the feeling though of like not, re- I like the idea of not resisting the feeling because that yeah. is a whole energy cycle itself. Of, and I really appreciate the advice or the reflection of acknowledging that it's a real feeling, yeah. experiencing the feeling, yeah. also knowing that as you experience it, you are moving towards like the next phase through it. Yeah. Um, because I actually do find that that is the best way to move forward is actually you got to experience and know that it's a real thing because otherwise you start to tell yourself that you're, you're losing it, right? When you're like resisting these feelings that you have because you know they're real, but fighting them too hard actually can be even more damaging. And so I appreciate your your transparency and your honesty. Um, my last question for you is what is something that's very meaningful for you professionally, with your firm, personally, that we haven't talked about here or before that you just really, it's on your heart and mind and you'd want people to know? Uh, I think what's really meaningful about like wireless environment, you know, like given the cancel culture and the woke culture and the fact that, you know, everybody seems to be afraid of basically saying anything. Otherwise, uh, we have created an environment where you can say, you can make mistakes, even if you say the most inappropriate thing. You do the worst, one of the worst, you know, as long as it's not crime, like we stop when it's crime. When it's crime, you gotta go. I'm sorry. But if it's short of crime yeah. and <laughs> you realize that you've made a mistake, you apologize for it and you never repeat it again, you're in a safe environment. So we, um, uh, we, we encourage anti vaxxers, Trump supporters, uh, people who are conservative, people who are liberal, people who believe in um, non-monogamous relationships, people who like poly relationships, like, I mean, anything to come forward and speak about their opinions without them being shut down or, or judged. We encourage that because we need a safe environment to thrive. And that's one of the reasons uh, that we're thriving as much as we are. Like, we do not believe in the corporate culture where somebody says one wrong word and then there's all this training and public apologies and whatnot that, that's really meaningful to me because i feel safe going to work every day i don't i don't feel like i'm um i'm in a culture of fear you know like i, I feel like we're in a culture of freedom 
and and space to breathe and that that means a lot to us and for for that reason that's the reason why i've taken all the risks that i've taken it's just been safe it, there's never been a fear so it's 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 amazing how um so much of what you just talked about and what you stand for was seen as diametrically opposed to business scalability and profitability yeah. and it was seen as like the antithesis of of that possibility and what yeah. you've proven which i think matters the most is the human empathy, inclusivity, and equity that you create has actually been a business driver for you. Yeah. And I think that that's, that's probably the most proof and impact that anyone can make because it really quells the noise around, yeah, well, good for you for being a, a nice human, but it'll never work as a business. And, and you've proved that it, that it has, and it does. And so I can't wait to see where you continue to take it, my friend. You're, you are the future right now. And so for everyone that doesn't know Lena, although I can't imagine there are that many you have to make sure to go find her, check her out, see the example that she's living all the time. So Lena Yousafi, Why Law, thank you so much for joining us on the What You're About podcast. It was a pleasure as it always is, my friend. And I can't wait to hopefully see you in Toronto very soon. Thank you so much, Chad. It was a pleasure. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.